What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Monik Bond of Link Graph and Search Atlas. And Monik, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people like to check out that they should check out of the podcast. We were actually um, talking for a second about uh, Jason Swank. Jason Swank, I did two episodes with him, actually. One is how he built his agency up to eight figures and sold it. And the second is kind of his next stage of life, um, which is he's buying up agencies and he's also has a great um, uh, mastermind group for agencies as well. Um, I had, let's see, um, Kevin Hurrigan was a good one. Uh, he's been an agency owner, Monik, since 1995. And so it was interesting to hear the evolution of his services, his company and the industry in general. Um, just uh, he runs Spinia Tech. And uh, Todd Tasky is another good one where he kind of pairs agency with private equity and helps sell agencies. And he has a second bite podcast. So he's found that some of these uh, agencies make more on the second bite than they do in the first. Uh, we will talk about Monik's journey of selling one of his, his companies too. So this will be an interesting conversation. So that and many more on inspiredinsider.com. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 at rise 25 uh, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do strategy, accountability, and the full execution and production around a podcast. You know, Manic, we call ourselves kind of the magic elves that run around in the background to make sure that the host looks great and it's easy and they could have great conversations and run their business. You know, for me, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. And I am excited to introduce Monik Bond. He's the founder and CEO of LinkGraph. Uh, LinkGraph is a digital marketing firm that helps agencies and enterprise brands scale through data-driven SEO. Uh, and Monik has been a member of the Inc. 5000. He's winner of Drum Search Awards. He's also the creator of Search Atlas, which is an SEO automation platform used by thousands of brands and agencies. Uh, he's also been a keynote speaker, uh, industry conferences, um, affiliate summit, traffic and conversion, and many more. And Monik, thanks for joining me. Great to be with you. So just start off with. Um, Link Graph and, and what you do. And then we'll kind of talk about Search Atlas and the differences there. Sure. So Link Graph, we are a, a full service digital marketing firm with a, with a heavy focus on SEO. Uh, and we today we power over 500 agencies and brands globally. Uh, we've, we do that with our own proprietary software that our team has been developing over the last five years called Search Atlas. We now have over 10,000 active users using the platform and growing. Uh, and that technology we, uh, includes everything from link building outreach uh, tools to keyword research tools to content opti optimization software, uh, competitor gap analysis tools, uh, and much, much, much more. And LinkGraph is the firm that actually helps brands and agencies implement the technology and uh, brings to bear our know-how in the space and our playbooks uh, for firms that are just looking for the technology and access to it itself. That's you can find on searchatlas.com. Uh, and if you're looking for help uh, and you're not sure exactly where to go, I would recommend going to LinkGraph first and reach out to someone on the team. And we guys, we can help you guys get set up. So who's a good fit for LinkGraph and who's a good fit for Search Atlas? Yeah. So LinkGraph, I would say brands that are. Uh, that are looking to figure out how to scale their SEO, especially in really competitive niches where uh, they're just getting their start, or maybe they've got their seed round or their Series A round, and they're trying to figure out how to take on the Goliaths in their space. 
uh, or they're having challenges figuring out how do they actually scale their SEO uh, in a really concrete, data-driven, specific way and, and actually get those hockey stick charts. Uh, we work with a ton of enterprise brands, uh, companies such as the Olympics and Shutterfly, Procter & Gamble, uh, e-commerce brands like Serena and Lily and many others. So uh, brands like that are a great fit for us. We also work with a ton of agencies. So agencies that offer SEO uh, to their clients and are looking for a scalable way to get uh, more uh, links built, more authority built, uh, more results for their clients, and also just help them with building good reporting tools to show clients the ROI from the SEO work that they're doing. And we will set up Search Atlas and use it and also train the agencies and the brands in how to use the technology so that they can get the most out of it as well. So that's what I'd say about LinkGraph. We, we do offer managed SEO campaigns for brands and agencies. We offer pure play link building packages. We offer technical SEO services. We offer reputation management uh, and, and also really scalable and cost-effective local SEO campaigns. Uh, and with any managed campaign, we actually guarantee you will get results because we've just been doing this for such a long time now that we we feel really confident in our ability to uh, guarantee that our customers will actually see results uh, as a result of just the the approach that we take and our playbooks and the technology that we use. Yeah, and you can see here if you're watching the video piece, if you're just listening to the audio, there is a video out there um, and you can see we're actually on link graph and there's managed SEO, there's link building, there's local SEO, there's technical SEO, uh, all those options. Um, on the search Atlas side, whose idea? On the search Atlas side, yeah. So search Atlas is a great tool. If you're an agency and you already have your own uh, approaches to link building and a lot of the other services that I described and you feel confident that your team has it under wraps, uh, or if you're a brand and you're doing those activities in-house and you feel really confident about your approaches, uh, Search Atlas can still be a great help and benefit to you. The platform includes uh, backlink analysis software, content optimization technology, the ability to track uh, every keyword your site ranks for on a daily basis, which is so much more powerful than other tools like SEMrush and Ahrefs, which track rankings on a periodic basis between every, let's say, 14 days to 60 days. Uh, and, and I think what a lot of people really love about the toolkit is our new auto SEO AI recommendation engine, which actually puts together all of the tools in the platform and just tells you these are the things you need to do. So if you're a team and you're kind of struggling to figure out, like, like let's say you're the head of like a digital marketing team and you've got a team underneath you of content strategists, of web developers that work on the website, of uh, PR and outreach professionals that actually try to go and get your brand linked and mentioned on the internet, this toolkit will actually give that team recommendations and tasks that they can implement every single week and benchmarks your performance as you use the tools and as you follow the recommendations. It'll actually track and show you the momentum and the SEO crescendo, if you will, that you'll get out of using it. It works really well. We use it on all of our clients and it, it really helps with some of those really nuanced, nitty gritty uh, SEO, uh, very technical things that you would need someone to kind of go through your data with a fine tooth comb. The AI does a great job of finding that information and filtering out all the information that's not relevant and just servicing key actionable recommendations. So a lot of people really love that tool. But uh, if, if you'd like a walkthrough, you'd like to, to get a more kind of comprehensive look at the toolkit, feel free to schedule a demo. You can hit that button right in our, in our nav. Um, and we're happy to walk you through the, the, the toolkit and help you figure out how uh, your team or your agency can make best use of it. Mike, you know, creating a software is a big undertaking, right? I mean, you started off an agency, you sold it, um, then you started another. And you started to create software. So I'm curious of why, because you could have been like, listen, this is a pain. We have to create a whole team around it. We have to, it's a lot of work. Um, let's just cobble together. Let's just use what, what's out there. And mm -hmm. what, why did you make the decision 
to create your own. And, and you can see if you're looking at this, I, I love how you kind of visually display this. So anyone who's for their company, how they do their pricing you know, table or however it is, it's kind of take a look at uh, Search Atlas and, and what they do. And because it shows, it's cool how you just show and build the value of one tool um, and replacing it. So I love the psychology and everything that you do on this page. So you could check it out because he has replaces, what tools it replaces, the features, and then what the cost is. Obviously, when you add that up, what other tools are using? Because we know that, Monica, we know what tools, but we don't mentally in our head kind of add them all up in our head. So I kind of like, I liked how you display this, but why go out and create your own software? Yeah, well, why did I lose my hair building all of this <laughs> for sure? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, the the simple answer is when when we started this project, it actually began as a research project. It began by studying Google's patents, going through the scientific literature on how search engines work so that we could really start thinking like Google, thinking like a search engine and thinking about the problems that they have to solve in a way that's sort of empathetic to what it's what it means to be Google. Not a lot of people think about Google and think, oh, hey, let's empathize with them. But we that was sort of our hat that we put on is like, let's think about the issues they're trying to solve. And from that place, figure out what do we need to do as practitioners to give them what they're looking for. And that research journey led us to understand their ranking factors in a really, really meaningful way. And the way that I would just summarize that those years of research is Google really breaks down the ranking factors into four quadrants. The ranking factors that are related to authority. Uh, authority is basically like the backlink profile of the website, the brand signals, the historical data that they have on the domain to see how long people spend on the site, what their engagement patterns are. That is all relevant to building the authority profile of the domain in Google's eyes. That is a huge ranking factor, probably the most important one. The second one that's really important is content. That would include the blog posts you have on your website, the landing pages, the services you offer, the way you describe those services, the facts you have on your website, the information that you're presenting to, to readers, your topical relevance, which is how wide your content is able to appeal to what a searcher may be looking for, the depth, which is in how great of a depth are you actually dis discussing the topics that you want to rank for. Google is studying all of that now, and that's become a really significant way that they ascribe uh, what, what is sort of termed as knowledge-based trust of a domain. The content signals are really important, and we've got software that really addresses that for Google and helps you boost that for pages. Then we've got technicals, which would be like your on-site, your crawling, the, the, link, the links on the website, all the little more technical nuances to how the server is set up and things like that. And then also the uh, signals, the, the uh, page experience signals. So uh, how long people stay on the page. Uh, what are they doing on the site? How often are they clicking through from page to page? And, and so all of those confluence of factors is really the full uh, dimension of SEO. When we started, we realized that the toolkit that we were using, when we were using all of, all of these competitor tools that you see on there, including SEMrush, Ahrefs, Moz, our bill was like three, $4,000 a month in just software to get all of these tools under one umbrella. But what we discovered is those tools didn't do what the patent was really talking about. There were aspects of what the patent was referring to that we realized these tools were incomprehensible. And so we had to build new tools. And, and there were also not always tools that could help us study things like content depth and, and topical relevance and topical authority. There are no tools that currently do that on the market as far as I'm aware, besides what we've developed or tools that help do outreach for link building purposes at massive scale. So it was just a big gap that we saw. And we started building them one by one based on what was taking our firm the most time. So we basically were able to offer our services to our clients at a cheaper and cheaper and cheaper price point and at a higher scale and take on much larger engagements. So for context, my first startup 
Ruckus, which I sold six years ago, the entire authority profile that we built to that domain over the course of five years of hard work, we can now build in one month. That's the kind of acceleration that the technology has enabled us to get to. So yeah, and we just kind of kept going and going with the platform to really service our clients and our agency's clients, our partner agency's clients, I mean, um, in the best way possible. I want to talk about why you started Ruckus. Because when I look at your journey, you have an unconventional path, right? I look at your journey, right? At Duke, your neuroscience and chemistry. I look at that, I'm like, oh, he's prepping to be a doctor or something. I, I don't know. Um, so Trying to make at, the parents proud. At that time, what were you thinking you wanted to do? Uh, back in college? Yeah, in college. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, at the time, I sort of envisioned my path going into medicine. Um, and I think actually like starting to pursue that path, I realized it wasn't the right one for me. And I'm really glad that I didn't end up going down that, uh, in that direction. It would not have been the right fit for me. I'm, I'm terrible with blood. If I see blood, I start to faint. So, uh, would have been a really bad fit for that. You could have gone radiology though, something, but you still have to go through the training. Is, is that. Ultimately, because you know, right now, maybe someone's listening and they're not sure what path, and maybe that's one of the paths. What made you decide ultimately, you know, this isn't where I want to spend the rest of my life? This is not what I want to be doing. Well, I, I just felt called uh, in a different direction. To me, when I did my soul searching, what I really discovered is that my passions lied elsewhere. I was really interested in markets, I was really interested in, uh, in business. And that interest of mine took me in a very different direction. And I ended up going to Wall Street, where I feel like I was able to really sink my teeth into that, working at Goldman, learned a ton. Uh, and through the process of being there for four or five years, uh, found my next passion, which was actually in technology at the time, seeing companies like Groupon IPO, eBay IPO. It was so fascinating. Um, to see the energy that was in the room that we had never seen anything like that since the first tech uh, boom. So that really pulled me in, into this new direction at the time. I didn't realize uh, that I would end up becoming a CTO and building my own tech companies, but I was interested in, in technology uh, and had no idea where the path would lead. So I think it was just staying curious and pursuing my interests and also noting that that you know can change as you go through the course of your life. So talk about Ruckus and what was what was the first step into starting Ruckus? Oh, the first step was it was um, it was realizing. So I, I actually had some tickets to a concert. I'm not going to say which concert it is because I'm embarrassed and the viewers would judge me too much. Um, but uh, my maybe you'll release it. maybe you'll you'll share it at the end as a curiosity base. But n now I want to know. Obviously, maybe we'll put in the show notes uh, just to get people to into there if they really want to know. But I'm not going to get into it right now. It, it was my girlfriend's idea. She wanted to go. We ended up getting like really really good seats, like front row seats. And then of course, like the day came and we just couldn't go to the concert. And I ended up selling them online. And I ended up actually making money, like doubled my money. They were like $1,000 seats each, and I sold them for about 2000 something on StubHub. And, and I was fascinated by that. And I've always been very in, into music. I was a like, professional violinist and guitarist and grew up like, classically trained and always like, loved spending my time going to shows and events. So uh, that curiosity led me into this crazy... Uh, industry of of ticketing, uh, Ruckus was a secondary uh, secondary market for concert sports theater tickets, and um, it was it was incredibly humbling to try to build a marketplace as my first technology company. So I got really, <laughs> uh, I, I got I got kicked in the teeth many 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 times trying to build that company, almost failed and gave up three four times, but I just kept going. Um, I have been known to be kind of a stubborn person. And uh, refusing to give up is definitely like a key part of my personality. So I kept going and eventually launched the platform as a mobile ticketing app with virtual reality experiences where you could actually see your seat in the app in 3D. 
which is really you're ahead of your time there with the vr stuff yeah we we were actually we before people started really getting into it we built we called like the power glove and it was three cameras attached to like this glove and you would take two shots from a seat and it would stitch together a full 360 degree pano of what it's like to sit in that seat we were sending drones we actually sent drones into yankee stadium in new york into the red bull arena and we were trying to basically get all this footage of of the arena we actually almost got arrested for that i'm like do you have to get Uh, approved ahead of time or you just oh we're just gonna try this yeah you know this is like the startup mentality it's like you know ask for forgiveness not not for, for permission and so that's what we did and fortunately the cop was like this is pretty cool. This drone thing is awesome. We had a lot of questions about the drone and just like, let us go. Did we someone were, we were spot thankful. it or how did it, uh, someone inside the stadium spot it or what, or were they just see you standing outside the stadium with a remote control and they thought you were bombing something? <laughs> well, yeah. So fortunately, um, fortunately it wasn't me flying the drone. It was someone else on the team. Uh, who looks a lot less suspicious <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they were like they were racially it. profiling you. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 they saw the drone inside the arena. And, uh, and I think one of the, one of the, the um, groundskeepers saw it and notified the police that there was a drone inside the arena, which is totally understandable for safety purposes. And in short order, found us outside uh, sitting on the hood of a car with like, a goggle on, you know, to see the, see the view with like controller in the hand. Uh, and I think it was about three squad cars that. Wow. Up. You tell yeah. the staff member, yeah, it'll be fine. You go do it. I'll wait back. Just call me when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I was at home when I got the call. So yeah, fortunately we had a really an incredible team of people who was super passionate about what we were building and, and the vision. And so it didn't take a lot of convincing. That's awesome. So what was one of the challenges you remember? Again, like in startup world, there's many times where there's bumps in the road and people want to quit. What was uh, one of a big, the big challenges uh, with Ruckus? It was, a, it was a very much a David V. Goliath uh, kind of experience from day one. Our total um, fundraising was the lunch money. Uh, of our competitors, you know, they would spend millions and millions of dollars on marketing for branding purposes. And meanwhile, our entire budget for the entire company, including R and D for years was like what they would spend in like, you know, a couple weeks, uh, you know, $5 million. So we had to be very judicious and really careful with all of our bets. And we didn't have a lot of room to make a lot of mistakes. So we had to try to be really thoughtful and as much as we could stay profitable and lean. So uh, with, with execution, that was always challenging. It was always a little bit nerve wracking, uh, not knowing if, you know, this bet was the right bet and if it would work out. So um, obviously not everything we did worked, but we did have a lot of things that we invested in work. And I think the best thing for us was investing in our brand, investing in a product experience that was memorable and differentiated uh, and brought the team together in a way where we were all really proud of what we created and eventually led to us being acquired by StubHub and TickPick for the technology and the audience. I want to hear how the acquisition came about, but were you using the the SEO? What were you doing with the SEO to build to Ruckus at the time? So SEO was an important part of our strategy. Uh, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that the biggest ticketing company in the world is Google. Everyone thinks Ticketmaster and some people think StubHub, but it's actually Google. If you think about how much those platforms spend on paid media to Google, Google owns a sizable share of the total economic value in that industry. So understanding how to win on Google organically for every company in that space is a key part of their business strategy. For us, because we were newcomers to the space, we had to build uh, notoriety for ourselves through our product, through our software. So what we really tried to do was build something special and different and be really cutting edge on the technology side and give people something that they'd never seen before. And that allowed us to get a lot of great press, a lot of access. Uh, We were in every New York City taxi cab for 
C360, which was a big product that we launched. And that was really great for our awareness. And then that eventually led us to getting a partnership with Shazam, where we were powering Shazam's ticketing experiences in their app and got uh, SEO um, backlinks from them on their website, which helped us in search. So um, in investing in the product again, in the brand, doing something very different than what everyone else was doing, allowed us to step apart from the herd of other companies that were in the space fighting for recognition. And that eventually helped us get acquired. You know, Mike, one of the things I've seen is when companies have grown, some of the fastest growing have, has occurred because of partnerships. Um, what can you talk about forming partnerships like Shazam? How did those come about? Yeah. Th- so for big partnerships like that, the one of the things that I've learned is they're really based on relationships. <clears throat> it's it's building trust with the key players on the other side and really, really listening very intently to what their needs are, especially in a dynamic where we were a much smaller company than they were. So we didn't really have as much leverage in the negotiations. It was always us trying to understand how do we really drive uh, a revenue opportunity forward for them? How do we understand what, what they're looking to do here and give them something that they can only get from us? So what that was, was we we realized Shazam was really into their brand and and for good reason. They have an incredible brand. So we actually redesigned our venue maps to include their logo. Uh, and it was a, it was something that we could do. It, it, it took some work, but it showed them how committed we were to the partnership. And we were going that extra level that they realized that there were really no other companies in the space that had the integrity as well as the technology capabilities that we did. And it allowed us to eventually ink the deal after over a year of of um, of working through it, and it did take a long time. I love it. You know, thanks for that. That's great. Um, how did the acquisition eventually come about? Well, we at the time at which we were we were looking to exit, we had a few companies that were in orbit that were interested in us, and uh, what we really needed to do was figure out. How do we organize those conversations in a way where we can get the best outcome for the company? Uh, And so it was just about getting getting everyone that saw value in what we had created to the table at the same time and encouraging them to uh, put their bids forward and uh, and us trying to really maximize the value we're able to create. So we had to be a little bit creative with how we structured it to get the best value out of it, but we did. And um, fortunately, we were working with some some really great partners at the time that helped us manage the process and uh, successfully close and execute the deal. I'm sure, Monica, you were thinking of a bunch of interesting ideas, right? So you exit and like, what's next, right? What, I guess, was on the chopping block? You know, obviously, Link Graph, Search slash search atlas was one of the ideas. What else were you thinking about that maybe got cut before you kind of move forward with that path? Well, once once the exit happened, I, I knew I needed to take some time off and just recharge my batteries. And uh, and so I did spend some time with family, with friends, did some traveling. And the one thing that I kept coming back to was what I felt was like an unclosed chapter or an unanswered question. And it was really around Google. And, and I, and I knew, and and everyone knows how important Google is as a, as a technology platform. I mean, it's essential, I I think, to the way that humanity that we find and discover information. It's like, it's like the library of information on the internet and it's fast and it's free. And I realized how critical a platform that it would always be now and forever in the future. And I really felt like there was more there. So there were some other ventures that I was involved in. I was helping my friends uh, with their companies, helping them figure out their approach to go to market and growth. And I realized all of them had the same similar set of problems with Google, which is how do I get Google to love me? How do I get 
found on the first page of Google? What are they looking for? And why don't they understand that I'm the best company in the space? I've got the coolest product. I've got the best experience. I'm doing something really different, right? Why don't they get that? I don't understand. And and it's a, it's a common problem that I see with startups. Like they're doing something interesting and, and innovative, but they don't have that reputation, the authority in the eyes of Google. So everyone was struggling with authority, building up authority, creating domain authority in the eyes of Google. And that was a, a common problem that I knew needed to be solved. So after reading some of the literature that Google had about how they evaluate that, uh, I started figuring out how to solve that problem and do it at scale. And it was initially just a research project. And we were crawling the internet. One of the reasons we call it link graph is because I was building a link graph of the internet, how the internet sites connect to one another through different pages. What are some websites that are linking to other sites a lot and passing do follow links? And I was doing that to figure out what types of websites can you get links from and how do they link? Uh, and then trying to like deconstruct that. And that ended up sort of forming the path that led to creating LinkGraph and Search Atlas. So it just kind of happened like organically. What were your thoughts at that time of bootstrapping versus raising money? So as someone who has raised money for startups before, one of the things that I never enjoyed about that process was feeling like it was a treadmill that you were always on. And really, I'm, I'm a product guy. I, I'm, a, I'm a tech guy. I like digging into like the, the business problem more so than I like being on the road and glad handing investors and convincing them and, and getting them excited about what we're building. So me being more interested in actually applying myself to solve the problems uh, more so than raising capital made it really obvious to me that raising capital is not something that I wanted to do, especially in the early days. And was fortunate that I had uh, some capital that I could use to start the company and see how it would go. Uh, and fortunately for this company in particular, we began doing a lot of, of work consulting and servicing other brands. So it did have the ability to be profitable very quickly. It didn't need a lot of upfront capital investment. The software did, but we slowly like legged into that as we built the agency and the firm up. We had more capital to invest into the software. And that then helped us build the agency and the firm even more. Love it. You worked with the Olympics. What, yes. what kind of uh, stuff did you do at the Olympics? So the Olympics is so interesting. When we think about the Olympics, we think about like watching the Olympic Games uh, and looking at the Olympics as a digital marketing event uh, and unpacking what that really represents. We've got hundreds of languages right? globally, all these audiences tuning in to their local Olympic team, their local Olympic website that's written in a different language, right? Uh, whatever their language is, those websites all have their own technical challenges and their own issues servicing their official content on Google and to their audiences. And with the Olympics, what was so interesting is even though you, you have these official Olympic websites out there, representing the team, whether it's a team of Serbia or the team of Croatia or the team of, of, of Spain, there, are, there were other competing sites that were taking traffic away from them just because those sites weren't optimized properly from an SEO standpoint or Google couldn't crawl them. So a lot of the work was just setting standards across all of these hundreds of Olympic websites in different languages for different audiences and helping them establish like good technical fundamentals, website fundamentals, giving them all audits that their teams could then use to repair and fix the websites. And in some cases, we helped them do that as well uh, to solve some of the, the bigger, more challenging issues and hurdles so that their sites could be optimized, discoverable by Google, and um, engaging their audience at this very, very critical time of the Olympic event. I'd so it was to... great fun. And very exciting. So a lot of moving pieces there. Challenge. Tons of moving pieces. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about a B2B example also. 
Um, and you, there was a data visualization company. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, so one of our clients, there, we have, we have a, a, a NDA in place, so I, I can't share too much about who they are, but they're a, a public data visualization company. And <clears throat> one of the interesting challenges that they have is that their product, it, it is a global B2B product. And that means if they want to reach audiences in China and in Japan and in Germany, they have to create content in all these different languages and uh, making sure that content is factually accurate and fact-checked and readable and really conforming to a very high standard was a challenge for them. And they wanted us to help up. They wanted us to help them figure it out. So we helped them build a, a pipeline where we were actually using AI and machine learning to help them translate those pieces from English into each language. And then confirm that those those articles were all written correctly. And then once the content was created, also uh, building authority in Google's eyes in each of those countries. They're a U.S. company. That's like where their headquarters is. So they've got tons and tons of recognition as a brand here in the United States, but not abroad. And so one of the biggest challenges that we had to do was figure out how do we actually do outreach to journalists and publications abroad in different languages and respond in different languages so that we can actually secure them digital PR far, far away from our, our home turf. And that was a great and fun challenge for us to solve. You know, Monica, first of all, thank you. I have one last question. Um, before I ask it, um, I want to point people, they can check out linkgraph.com and uh, searchatlas.com to learn more. Um, my last question, Monica, is your favorite tools and software outside of the SEO space. You know, obviously, I'm sure Search Atlas is, is your favorite. Um, but outside of that, what are some of your favorite tools and software that you use as a, an organization or personally? Well, or person, I think I'm I'm absolutely fascinated by Mid Journey, uh, the ability to to take text and generate images that are so beautiful uh, and creative and stunning it is still something I'm wrapping my mind around. So I'm I've been really following with great intent uh, the innovations happening on the AI content generation space. Uh, I'm really interested in AI generated music, AI generated images. AI generated video now as well. So there's a lot of really fascinating um, things happening in that space. Which uh, any stuff, specifically uh, in the AI? So here's this is Mid Journey. This is what you're referring to. Yeah, I feel like I'm in the Matrix. Okay, you are more than you know, <laughs> um, and it's a it's an incredible platform. You do have to use Discord to leverage it. So you sign up with Discord, uh, and through Discord, you can actually generate AI-generated images uh, within their chat experience. Uh, and they're stunning. The quality of the images is just uh, absolutely huh. mind-blowing. I actually used it to generate a children's book uh, for my wife for her birthday about our daughter. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And it was also, uh, I think, a great testament to the power that this technology has. So this one's just a fun one for me. That's really pretty wild. It. Yeah. What, any other AI tools that you like that you're experimenting with? Ooh. Um, hmm. Probably like there's some really experimental ones and they're, they're kind of, they're not yet all the way there. This is the one that I would, I would feel most confident recommending. Cool. Uh, what other tools yeah. and software do you like? You know, um, I mean, it's going to sound kind of lame because I think everyone appreciates them now, but Slack, uh, big fan of Slack, big fan of Loom. Uh, for teams, what we really try to do is really minimize our in-person meetings. And so what we do is we send a lot of asynchronous video communication with each other. So we use Loom extensively uh, to do that within our team. And I'm a huge, huge proponent of that technology. I so really, really like that. Awesome. Monica, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your journey and uh, everyone check out more episodes of the podcast and link graph and search Atlas. Thanks, Monica.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 